Chapters sixty two through sixty four of Out of the Shadow by Rose Gollop Cohen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter sixty two. Father felt relieved when L. V. was gone. Upon the correspondence he chose to look as nonsense. He thought if he showed he looked upon it, the correspondence and the promise to wait, as nonsense, it would soon in my mind too be nonsense and come to nothing. But it was not at all so i arranged my life now or it arranged itself in some sort of a systematic way this was the end of june i soon left for white birch farm since that first summer i continued to go there every summer though my health was better now i had many little responsibilities there by now and both irene and i felt a part of the place and it was so that we were looked upon by the doctor and miss farley not to go there now that i was well never occurred to me i even thought that it was fortunate for my people that i could go since i was no comfort to them the less i was home the better and as for me the very thought of that sweet quiet life out there was a joy when winter came i went back to my tucking machine in the evening i wrote my letters and read a good deal i went out little i wanted passionately to be true on a sunday or an evening during the week i would go to see miss o'there who lived in brooklyn I would walk to and across the bridge, thinking over all I wanted to talk to her about. But often when I came near the little house, my courage failed me. I was in constant fear of meeting strangers, and I would turn and walk back. One night what I feared happened. Once when I came and she opened the door for me, I heard voices, laughing and talking. I wanted at once to run away. I knew that some of the girls who were visiting her were teachers, and some were still attending normal college i thought what have i in common with them what can i say to them what can they have to say to me and i mumbled that now that i had seen her i would go home she looked at me and there was a twinkle in her eyes i could never hide anything from her the next moment she begged me earnestly to meet the girls stay and make friends of them and i begged her not yet wait till i learn a little more but they too will be learning she said do you suppose they will stand still come you will learn from them and ruth you too might have something to teach them the next moment she opened the door meet my friend she said and i saw five girls of about my own age stand up through the years each one has become so dear to me and i do not know where to begin and what to say i can tell of that first evening only i did not get their names but in the course of the evening each one did something different and it was so that i remembered them later three of the girls were sisters the eldest an athletic-looking girl with a wealth of brown hair and a hearty laugh played the piano the next sister who bubbled with enthusiasm sang scotch songs and the youngest with fine dark eyes and her hair still in a braid read aloud from margaret ogilvy by j m barry the fourth girl had a sweet voice and sang german songs and the fifth a quiet girl would every now and then say something in her quiet way and there would be a burst of laughter but they did not perform all evening they also talked they talked about the theatre the opera foreign language to me they talked about school and college the labour champion was there they talked about labour there seemed to be no end to their knowledge and their plans they even talked in a dreamy way about taking a trip to europe when all the girls should graduate and earn money miss o'there was with them in all their dreams and her white-haired mother was as young as the rest after this the girls would hunt me up and make me join them one of the sisters helped me to a little more systematic study besides these girls there were my old friends the woman i met through the hospital whom i would visit most of them were unhappy in some way or another and tried to forget they and their lives still fascinated me there was one who lived in one of the most beautiful homes there are in the city she gave me the new testament which i still have and would talk to me of this simple life there was another a very charming woman i used to hear her friends say of her with a great show of enthusiasm those big rough men at the church are like putty in her hands she felt she knew the working people's lives yet she used to invite me to come and see her at the queerest hour six o'clock when i would be coming from work i could no longer listen without criticism and it was often hard to go from their homes to my own but there was one whom i loved to visit she was twenty-five and she was a mixture of three different nationalities german french and american 
she was so good and so beautiful that it seemed she inherited only the best qualities of the three nations she showed frankly that she knew nothing about the working people and that she was curious she could never stop wondering at my going out alone at night she had never been out without a chaperone she would often urge me to put on a veil at least she once said put it on when you come to your own neighbourhood i laughed at her and assured her that i was safer in my own neighbourhood than in hers in your neighbourhood i said there are so few people in the street and the houses stand so dark and still to her i too would talk frankly and we often got into arguments she defended her people and i defended mine she talked of refinement and culture i was at a loss what was refinement and culture she explained to me simply when for generations you live in a beautiful home you are surrounded by beautiful pictures you listen to beautiful music you eat good food you are taken care of do you see i said that i saw but it was all so puzzling it seems to me i said that when a man my father works all day long he ought to have a beautiful home he ought to have good food he too ought to get a chance to appreciate beautiful music all day my father is making coats yet his own is so shabby and my mother if you ever saw her hands why should she know of nothing but scrubbing and scrimping why should her children go without an education then her pretty forehead would pucker up she moved closer to me if we were on the couch her hand would clasp mine yes it does seem so she would say thoughtfully in this way a part of the two years passed in something like a peaceful way then father noticed that i had not the least intention of dropping the correspondence and he felt ill-treated and became bitter good god he complained to mother was it possible that the girl meant to keep up that nonsense he commanded me to drop writing the letters i refused and our troubles began once more now he fairly burnt me with his anger and i thought him cruel and was more relieved than ever when summer came and i could escape to the country father hated to see me go there he was in constant fear that i would forget whatever little there was in me that bound me to my race and this year it was the second my father whom i remembered so gentle cursed me as i was leaving and i went from home for three months without a word of farewell to him mother ran after me into the hall she suffered more than any of us from these ruptures she begged me not to leave my father without a kind word but i would not even look back she turned back into the house weeping and i went into a strange hallway and wept too at all our misery when i returned home in the autumn i could not hold out against father and i finally had to give up the letters but of l v i heard through a friend what those letters really meant to me i only now understood the letters out of the way father gave me a few weeks to forget and then began to consult matchmakers several nights a week now on coming home from work i would find a matchmaker and a young man father no longer kept a secret my friendship with l v he was in a terror about it he began to consult friends and relatives and they all seemed to combine against me wherever i went to visit now i was sure to find a young man and the relative or friend acting as a matchmaker the younger and seemingly more enlightened friends would argue what are you waiting for you are wasting your best years you are losing your best chances a lawyer we knew a very nice man who married money to establish an office said there is no love and still others spoke with pity you are chasing after a shadow this is not the age for religion the young man is a mercenary he is not sincere he is being supported by missionaries he is selling his soul for an easy life there are others like him and father would demand what do you want anyway the young man you saw last night is worthy ten of your kind with your queer notions he has fifty tailors working for him he will give you a home with carpet on the floor a servant and a piano i would answer i promised to wait but sometimes there were moments when i was tempted a home a piano but was this all i wanted and what was love now i knew that i still did not know with all my troubles i went to miss o'there whom i gave my every thought and she even in her affection never failed to tell me the truth these moments were always painful to both of us for i was so often wrong one night in the spring when i came to her it was the end of the second year and i was complaining of the old life and customs and father's treatment i suddenly noticed that she was all upset and i stopped talking quite abruptly 
i suddenly felt guilty and uneasy without knowing why you are always complaining about your father she said his selfishness his narrow-mindedness his hardness and soon summer will come and you will go away to the country every summer no matter where you are what you are doing you leave your work and you go away while the rest remain here sweating do you give a thought how your family lives here without your help i felt horrified i never saw it in that way before she went on you say he is scrimping he demands your board whether you work the week or not he lives for money one has to live for something his ideas right or wrong according to him you have been a disappointment he had placed all his hopes in you his oldest daughter who knows what this disappointment may have meant to him so i gave up white birch farm at first life seemed hardly worth living all day now lost in the clattering noise of the machine there was nothing to which to look forward now it would always be so feeding feeding the machine and then the night the nights were the worst i had forgotten what it was like in the hot summer there were five of us the two boys in one cot and we three girls in the other in the one room filled with the odor of cooking of kerosene oil the smell of grimy clothes of stale perspiration the heat of the body at first i lay with my two sisters in the sagging cot with an unconscious limb of one or the other thrown over me i wept then i thought why need it be so why and later little by little i became used to it and at my machine i would live certain moments in the country over again i would imagine myself in the grove i heard the children's voices under the trees were the red and green benches i had helped to make i walked down to the brook and sat on the rock from which i used to dive and listen to the quiet i smelt the grasses growing on the edge i felt the cool moist air on my face i sat perfectly still from far out came a familiar shrill cheerful call bob white and i was not so unhappy i saw that i could still visit white birch farm i was helping my people and my friend's approval meant much to me in august it was slack in our shop it was slack in all trades miss o'there urged that i deserved a vacation so i packed a few things and went to white birch farm and was heartily welcomed again i was in my little room with the pale blue walls and the window looking into the green trees again i played with the children in the shade of the grove i bathed in the brook i wandered about in the fields but what was it i could not find the joy of the other years wherever i looked i seemed to see cherry street i could not shut it out i saw the children on the hot and none too clean sidewalks the fire escapes littered with bedclothes overheated sickly infants tired out women the sight of the beautiful green fields irritated me and i went home in spite of miss o'there's letter urging me to stay of the forewoman's letter telling me that there was still no work in spite of miss farley's arguments i felt strangely glad to be home and share the good and the bad with my people chapter sixty three one day in the third year i met alby's friend i had seen him twice since the first time he had been introduced once during the first year he came on receiving a letter from alby asking him to come because he was alby's friend i too looked upon him almost as a friend i felt no awkwardness in talking to him i asked him that night to come again but he never came and i never saw him until i met him now in the street i was so glad he was alby's friend to him i could talk of l v whose image was growing more and more vague in my mind and the more vague it became the more i wanted to think and talk of him his friend guessed how it was he watched me curiously and smiled as if he were a little amused we walked about and we talked we talked of books we had read he was a russian and he had some education in that language english he had picked up in some such way as a hen gathered food a crumb here and a crumb there he was extremely well read in both russian and english i asked him to call but again i never saw him until we met once more by accident and again we walked and talked all evening this time when he was leaving me at my door i did not ask him to come and he asked me quite suddenly in his blunt way why i felt confused and did not know what to answer he bent and looked at me and then threw his head back and laughed i left him abruptly and went in 
the next night to my surprise he came up to our home he stayed all evening and talked to father about his work and father looked pleasanter than he had been for a long while after this he came often and brought books once almost two weeks passed and he did not come then we met by accident as i thought it seemed to me he looked thinner and i asked were you ill oh no he said and added after a moment without looking at me in his blunt way it is just this i am not ready to get married i stared at him a long minute before the full meaning dawned on me i felt my face flush i was indignant so sure is this young man he noticed my discomfiture oh you know how these things end he said at least i do he smiled i felt calmer by now and decided to deal with the young man by all means this must end if you feel there is danger for you of course i assured him there is none for me to my surprise he looked anything but happy at which my spirits rose let us say good night at once i said cheerfully i see he said crossly you are only too eager i laughed and we walked in silence for some moments then an idea occurred to me at which i could not help laughing i have a bright idea i said let us be friends but as soon as one of us feels the least bit of danger for himself he must tell the other at once that is brilliant he said in yiddish and laughed too but remember if it should be you i'll tell i assured him and laughingly we parted and now we saw each other often we would go to lectures often we would go for long walks and talk nonsense he said i was too serious and teased me until i had to laugh one day he asked me to go to the theatre with him but of course i would not go besides he had once said that women generally liked men for what they could get from them i was very touchy on the subject of my sex and i meant to teach him to have a different opinion i would not take anything from him at which he looked miserable and i thought it an excellent punishment and a good lesson then a time came when he began to demand to know what i had for supper and would insist on my coming to a restaurant he said i looked hungry and i would be indignant and accuse him of trying to boss me if i had allowed myself now i would have been happy but how could i when i thought of l v i felt miserable and guilty he had not returned at the end of the second year but now it was almost three years and he must surely soon come what would i say to him when he came i explained as well as i could one night in the spring a year later d c and i were taking a long walk it was windy and we walked with our heads a little bent i thought that he scarcely talked and he had remarked that i was so silent at ten o'clock we stood on the stoop before our door he was still silent suddenly i could not have told what came over me i said i think our friendship better cease here no sooner did i utter the words and he looked at me than i remembered the agreement we had once made in jest and i could see that he too remembered it i felt panic-stricken i rushed to the door pulled it open and ran through the dark hall the gas was already out i ran up a flight of stairs and there i stood panting the next moment i heard the door open a quick footstep in the hall and my name ruth i pressed my hand to my heart he had never called me ruth please come down came from the foot of the stairs i can't i said just for a moment i can't i want to see your eyes not to-night to-morrow then perhaps good night then i'll wait till you go in a moment later i called i am in good night i found the house dark when i opened the door from every corner came quiet breathing i felt the way to my cot sister too was asleep i sat down beside her and sat still for a moment i could almost hear my heart beating then i remembered that sister once wondered how it felt to be happy i touched her face wake up i wanted to tell her that i knew chapter sixty four that summer work was slow in father's shop and as he had at last saved a hundred dollars he thought when could there be a better opportunity to try business so the fall found us established in two rooms in the back of a little grocery store and the whole family was bent on making a success sister was behind the counter as she was the most competent and modern and really showed a knack for the business and father and mother did the rougher work and looked on 
now it was necessary and they must learn the modern ways learn from the children father shook his head at this sadly what a strange world he said at first the pennies came in so slowly that there was great fear for the long saved hundred dollars but little by little business began to improve indeed how could it be otherwise sister who was so good and kind and sweet-tempered would wait on a little girl buying two cents worth of milk with a courtesy as if she were buying a dollar's worth and father and mother and the younger girl and boy would any of them climb five flights of stairs at six o'clock in the morning with five cents worth of rolls for a customer who bought nothing else so trade was coming their way the store soon became one of the most successful in the neighborhood and sister became very popular the women told her their troubles the children saved their pennies in her care when she would pass through the block from everywhere children would come dancing up to her calling her name and greeting her affectionately every one loved and trusted her but there was one trouble about this store it threatened to absorb her whole life as neither father nor mother could write or keep accounts she was completely tied down to the store father who was happy to be making a living independent of the tailor shop found it hard to see how she should care for anything else but the store nevertheless he began to learn how to write of an evening then when business would be slow he would sit down at the counter with pencil and paper and try to copy the letters or numbers we would write out for him after poring over his slip of paper for a while he would look up his forehead covered with perspiration then he would lay down his pencil to rest his stiffened fingers and sigh it is hard to learn at my age children it is hard to learn the boy nineteen years old now the one who had once dreamt of becoming a great rabbi was not in the store he was bringing home the laurels though he was earnest and studious at thirteen he still had two years of public school ahead of him since he had begun late and what education he had was foreign so as he was of an extremely independent nature and also perhaps because he wanted to see something of the world he had made a great plea to be allowed to go to an agricultural school instead there he heard he could finish his elementary education and earn his living by working in the fields after school hours and at the same time learn a trade he would be an agriculturalist and it was from that school that he graduated two years later he was placed by the school with a gentile farmer it was passover and he thought of home and felt lonely and strange and one day he walked off to the station carrying his little trunk on his shoulder both were very small the trunk and the boy and for the present this was the end of farming after this he worked as a grocery boy a drug store boy a boy at a newsstand a delivery boy on wanamaker's wagons and through it all he had his troubles he was so honest and outspoken that as he went along he made as many enemies as friends above all he disliked pity and patronage one day while working on mr wanamaker's wagon he delivered a ninety-eight cent parcel the woman who received it at the door gave him a dollar and told him to keep the change he said a little huffily i imagine that he did not take tips and held out the two cents she looked him up and down and shut the door in his face so he laid the two pennies at her door and went away two days later there was a complaint of discourtesy against him and he was discharged because of his independence he was often in trouble but he managed somehow he paid a certain amount into the house and the rest he saved always for some purpose of study he often got into debt to the house but as soon as he would get work he would pay scrupulously every cent during an interval of out of work he had learned bookkeeping and typewriting and this was his work now while doing this he was also making regents counts and it was at this time that he took a civil service examination and was appointed clerk in the bureau of education in washington his dream was to earn enough money to go to columbia university he realized his dream and it was while in his last year at the university that he won the second prize in the world work contest on what the school will do for the boy of tomorrow from the material side this money came now as if in answer to his great need he had nothing with which to pay his last year's tuition and he was worried and discouraged but far greater than the value of this money was the honor for so we felt it to be mother had tears in her eyes her boy was at the great university her boy's article was valued second to that of a superintendent of industrial schools and father looked on at us silently unbelieving then he said ah 
after all this is america end of chapter sixty four end of out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen recorded by celine major